Hey everyone, I'm DQ Clark and this is your weekly Bible study parable on how do I please God? Each week I create and present a parable for you guys on a biblical topic or life principle. We talk about the meaning, the interpretation, and how it can apply to your life. Let's get started. So, the parable. There is a mother who had a lot of children. She birthed a lot of children and she adopted a lot of children. She loved her children probably more than anything. They were her babies, her prized possessions, the lights of her life. And her children loved her. They constantly sought ways to please her and to make her happy. They would buy her gifts to please her. They would take her cards or take her out to eat or clean up after her. They were constantly seeking ways to make her happy. While she loved that and appreciated all of that, she was simple. There were only a few things that she needed to really make her happy. Three actually were her top choices. She told them before what those things were that did make her happy, but she realized that they just wouldn't get it until they experienced them themselves. So she decided to try something. She wanted them to experience each of those three things so they would understand what she needed. She gave them each a little test. For the first test, she wanted them to know without a shadow of a doubt that she would be there for them, that she was there for them. Some of her children moved a little ways away, and when they first moved away, they would call her daily, text her all the time, constantly be in contact with her. When they first moved away, she would call them daily, text them, send them gifts, visit them. She constantly let them know that she was with them. In so many ways, she wanted them to know that she was right there with them. She was there for them. But in her little test, she stopped calling so much. She stopped visiting. She stopped sending the packages and the gifts and the text. She wanted them to know that whether she did those things or not, she loved them. She was there for them. She was with them. At first, they were a bit put out. They would call her more, but she wouldn't answer. They would stop by and visit, but she was away. They sent her letters and texts, but wouldn't get a response. Finally, some of them just sat on her porch and waited for her to come home. When she did, they were very upset with her. Didn't she love them? Why was she so unresponsive? She patiently and kindly explained that of course she loved them, but she wanted them to realize that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of whether she was flooding their inbox and their phone with messages and calls, regardless of the circumstances, she was there for them. She loved them. It made her the happiest, the most happiest for them to know that regardless of whether she showed signs that she was with them or not, that they would always know and trust that she was with them, that she loved them very much. When they finally understood, she ended that test. They realized that she wanted them to know that regardless of the circumstances, she was always there for them and she loved them very much. She had some other children who lived close by. She loved them a great deal too, but didn't always like how they acted. They would stay up all hours of the night doing all sorts of things that would get them in trouble. They would lie when they needed to or compromise, curse, cheat, steal. They knew she knew and didn't like it, so they would make it up to her by buying her things like flowers and gifts and even big ticket items like cars and patio furniture. She knew their motives though, and again, she loved them very, very much, but she didn't like everything that they did. For this test, she decided to play a game, so to speak. She enlisted the help of a few neighbors, and those neighbors did the same thing that these children did. They would stay up all hours of the night during the work week and party and play loud music and do whatever they wanted. The children who lived nearby never got any sleep. The neighbors would lie to the children, curse at them whenever they felt like it, and cheat and steal whenever they wanted to. The children were appalled. How could people live like this? The children spoke to the neighbors about it and the neighbors gave them a cheap apology. They threw an apology at him or a gift card at him every now and then. The children were offended. They didn't want their money. They wanted them to act right. When the children spoke to the mother about it, she reminded them of how they acted sometimes too. They felt horrible and finally understood. They changed their ways and she ended that test. For the third and final test, she wanted to make sure all of her children knew the importance of this particular test. This was the main thing. This was the most important thing to her. 
She loved her children. She loved all of them, but many of them did not treat other people well. It really hurt her heart. She would take a child who treated people well over a gift any day. So for this test, she enlisted the help of the children's workplace bosses. For the next few weeks, the bosses treated the children horribly. They would yell at them and gossip and slander about them behind their backs. They would change their wages, steal from them, and demand they work horrible, crazy hours. By this time though, the children had caught on that maybe this was their mother's doing. They went to talk to her about it and they confessed that they probably did treat people in the same way their bosses were treating them. They realized they were wrong and they apologized to their mother. They changed their ways. The children finally got it. And while they still did nice things for their mother, they realized that the real way to please her was really to be good to people. From then on out, they did both. They sought ways to please their mother with gifts and kind acts, but they also made sure that they were good to people just the way she wanted them to be. So the interpretation. So in this parable, we have a family represented as a mother and her children. The mother represents God, and I'm only using mother instead of a father in this particular parable because of the mother-child relationship we have here on earth, which I'll explain in a bit. But please do know that God is our heavenly father. He is definitely our wonderful heavenly father. The children in the parable represent all of us, God's kids, Christians. You know, on earth, a mother and her child share a very special bond. Perhaps it's because she carried those children in her own body. Perhaps it's because most times the mother is the caretaker, the main caregiver at home. Most times, not all times. Perhaps it's because of the self-sacrificing nature of mothers, always sacrificing, always giving of themselves. And we children, we do go out of our ways to honor our mothers because of it. I mean, you can look at what we do for Mother's Day as opposed to Father's Day, and you can kind of see how we go above and beyond on Mother's Day to celebrate our mothers, though equally so our fathers should be celebrated just as elaborately, but you can see the difference. And that relationship is kind of how we are with the Lord and kind of how he is with us. When you become a Christian, you have a special bond with the Father, with our Heavenly Father, that you don't really share with anyone else. It's a special bond through the Holy Spirit. That bond can't parallel to any other relationship in your life. It is absolutely one of a kind. He is our caretaker, our caregiver. He has sacrificed everything for us, even giving us Jesus Christ on the cross. He has sacrificed it all for us and even still blesses us and guides us even now. In the parable, the children love to honor their mother and think that gifts and doing things for her are what pleases her but they live lives that hurt her and displease her. And she wants to show them what really does please her. And this is our relationship, how we can be with God too. Some of us don't live great lives, don't live lives that are too great, but we may volunteer a Saturday or two a month at church or in the community or give an offering at church during the weekend. And we think that these sacrifices either cover up the other things that we've done or just make up for and please God in a way. We think, oh, I'm a good person because I do these things, so that should please God. But scripture says that God wants us to show love, not offer sacrifices. He wants us to know him more than he wants burnt offerings. Meaning, while the sacrifices and burnt offerings are good, the volunteer work, the extra money, the kind acts here and there, those are fine. What God really, really wants is our heart. And there are some main ways that we can give our hearts to God, that we can please him in that way. So there are three main ways that we can give our hearts to God to please him. Number one, faith in who he is. In the parable, we see that the mother wants the children to know that she is there for them, that she will always be there for them, no matter what. She wants them to have assurance in her love for them. And this is the same with God. Scripture says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. First, God wants us to believe that he exists. 
And this may sound silly, but there are a lot of people who don't even believe that he exists. And this hurts his heart. It would be like a child who was birthed by their mother, turning around to that mother and saying to that mother, you didn't birth me. That mother knew what she went through. She carried them, she delivered them. She knows that she birthed them. And for her child to turn around and disown her and discredit that would be crushing. God wants us to believe that he is there for us, that he's the creator of the entire universe. You know, all power is in his hands. He can literally do anything. And he wants us to believe that. He wants us to have faith in him. He wants us to believe that regardless of the circumstances, whether we're going through a great season or a tough season, whether we see evidences of him or we don't, he wants us to believe that he's there for us, that he loves us, that he's blessing us, that he will see us through whatever we're going through. There is just something about faith that acts as though it's a key that unlocks God's heart. I don't quite understand it, but that's just the way he is. That's just him. We've all heard about the five love languages. Well, I believe that faith is God's love language. He just responds to it. He loves it. He loves it when we place our faith in him. Two, obedience and a life devoted to God. The second way to please God is to live a life of devotion and obedience to him. Honestly, we don't really like the word obedience. Obedience means that we then have to obey someone in other words, put ourselves under someone, be submissive to someone. And in our human nature, we don't really like that. But the beautiful thing about that is there's a humility that comes with that. When we can get to the point where we realize, you know, I really can't do this life without God. I am nothing without God. I cannot successfully live a productive, blessed, wonderful life without the Lord. When we get to that point of humbling ourselves and showing God that we need him, that we cannot successfully do anything without him, we show our dependence on him and it's easy to obey him. It's no longer a bad word because we're looking for him. We're yearning for him. We're looking for his guidance and direction. We're looking to see what he's going to do next, how he's going to direct us next. And when you have been walking with God for a while, when you've learned to hear his voice and obey him and you do those things that he's telling you to do, you very quickly realize that everything he tells you to do is actually going to somehow bless you and end up being a blessing to you and to others in some way. Even if it doesn't seem like it at first, it ends up really, really blessing you, blessing others, just sort of knocking your socks off. You realize that God always has your best interests at heart. Scripture says that if we love him, we will obey his commandments. And keeping his commandments automatically yields a life that is devoted to him. We are his, we become his. Our life becomes his life and it makes it fun and easy and blessed. And this doesn't mean that we live a perfect life. We will mess up, we will make mistakes, but we live a devoted life, a life where we put our trust in him so that even when we do mess up, we can get right back up and get right back in there with Jesus and keep going and keep living for him. Three, how we treat others. This is the most important way we can please God. This is actually literally the most important part of this message. Jesus said, this is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And this is the second. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. No commandment is greater than these. God's heart is for people, people, all people. Big people, small people, black people, white people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people. God's heart is for all people. This political party people, that political party people, he loves all people. Scripture says that the entire law is fulfilled by keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Did you get that? The entire law, the entire Hebrew Bible, the entire Old Testament, meaning everything in the Old Testament, everything that God gave Moses to write, every law, decree, ordinance, every single letter, dot, every part of the law is summed up by keeping one command. 
love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this means that you must treat others the way you would like to be treated. This also means you need to learn how to love yourself the way God loves you. There are many people who don't love themselves. They actually strongly dislike themselves. So they actually do treat others the way that they treat themselves, which is not good at all. But when we love God with our everything, we inadvertently learn how to love ourselves. And when we learn how to love ourselves, we learn how to love others the way God wants us to. So how do we please God? First, we believe that he is and that he rewards those who earnestly seek after him. Second, We live a life of obedience and devotion to him. And third, we treat others, ourselves, and him the way he wants us to. It was so great spending this time with you guys. God is so pleased when we seek to learn more about him. He loves that. He loves us. And he loves that we seek to grow in our relationships with him. And if you enjoy the contents of this video, please subscribe to my channel. We do this every single week. I present a parable to you guys on a biblical topic or life principle. We talk about the meaning, the interpretation, and how it can apply to your life. And if you found this video helpful, thank you for liking the video and leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the video or if you have ideas for parables in the future. Thanks so much for watching guys. Have an amazing, amazing week. God loves you just the way you are. He loves you very much. God bless you. I'll see you next time.